What's up you guys? Welcome to Bloom Church Online. My name is Brittany and I have the wonderful honor and privilege of welcoming you here and introducing today's message to you guys today. Before I get into that though, let me just share a little bit of our heart here at Bloom. It's our desire to see you bloom into everything that you were created to be. We believe that you do this by first believing in Jesus, then belonging to life-giving community, becoming a disciple and winning the world by going out and making other disciples. You guys, we're currently in the middle of a sermon series called Effective, where we are walking through 2 Peter and all of the characteristics that he gives us to live an effective life as a disciple of Christ. And I know that today's message is gonna be so impactful and it's gonna give you some practical tools that you can take with you and apply to your life so that you can be making a difference where you're at. So let's go ahead and get into it for today. we fail to exercise control of our temper, we break the spirits of the people around us. Some of you have experienced a negative word spoken over you sometime in your life. You didn't apply for that job because you didn't think you'd get it. I didn't apply to that school because I didn't think I could get in. We can essentially change what happens because now our lives and our decisions are based off of the truth of who God says he is. We know who we are. We know our identity. We know the truth. God can and will use you in the healing of someone based on your prayers and what you believe and what you speak over them. I want you to listen to who you really are and I want you to hear God's promises and I want, to, I want you to hear your identity by what God says you are. What an incredible last week. Well guys, how's everybody doing this morning? I hope you're doing well. I want to take just one second and just welcome a very, very special group of people. That's everybody tuning in online. Can we give it up for our online family? Yeah. Guys, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Hey, we're in the middle of a series right now entitled Effective. And so what we've been doing over the past several weeks is we've been breaking down a passage of scripture that is in 2 Peter, and we're praying that this is going to radically shift some things in your life. It's going to help you be more intentional with the decisions that you make. And it says in 2 Peter, it says, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. In view of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen to do things and you will not fall away. Peter lays out eight things in this passage of scripture, eight character traits or values or virtues that you need in your life to become all that you were called and created to be so that you can walk in that godly life, so that you can walk in all of God's promises, right? So that you can be productive, you can be useful and effective, and then you won't fall away from all the temptations of this world. And what we've been doing over the last several weeks as we've been building these values and these virtues like rungs on a ladder, right? We've been looking at those things like rungs on a ladder and trying to get to building these things so we can get to new heights that maybe we couldn't get to on our own, right? And the first rung that we talked about, Pastor Mike talked about the first week, was we diligently add to our lives faith, Right? Faith is this foundational piece that if your life is not built on a belief that Jesus is who he says he is, right, and the word of God is true and that God's design for your life is perfect, you won't live in the godly life that he has for you. You'll let the world's corruption drag you away. The second run we talked about was that we diligently pursue moral excellence. Well, what is moral excellence? Well, a Christian must work out the salvation from which God works within him. And in a word, his life must reflect the character of Christ, right? The attractive character of Christ. The likeness cannot be acquired except through this personal and continuous encounter with him by faith. And that third one we talked about is we diligently grow in knowledge. It says in 2 Peter, it says, and moral excellence with knowledge, 
right? Not, we're not talking about book smarts. We're not talking about acquiring knowledge. We're talking about the knowledge of knowing who Jesus is and the character and the attributes of the person, the Jesus, the Messiah, and the sovereignty of him. Amen? Amen. Ernie talked a lot last week, and his, the fourth rung was we diligently pursue self-control. And what he talked about was self-control and how negative words affect us in so many profound ways. Ernie brought the house down last week. He did an incredible job. And he talked about how negative words affect us in profound ways. And it says in James, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. But today we are going to talk about perseverance. The next one on our ladder is perseverance. We diligently pursue perseverance. And so I, I thought a lot about this and I thought, well, how can I talk about perseverance? Perseverance is one of those things I think is, there's a lot of things in the Bible that I could have hit, but I actually want to look at it through the eyes of Job. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to Job 1. And while you're doing that, I'm going to break down just a little bit of the backstory of Job. And Job is this guy that I would say probably has everything he needs in life, right? He has riches, he has livestock, he's got a great family, he's got great children. And what happens is he's gonna be tested. The Lord allows the devil to test him. And this is where I wanna pick up the story. We're gonna read a lot of Bible today, okay? We're gonna read a lot of scripture today, that's a good thing. We're gonna read a lot of scripture. And I'm gonna tell you, as we go through this message, There's a lot of moments in here where I can step on some toes, but I want you to know that I have stepped on my own toes so many times, so many times, and I have lived this message, okay? I have lived this message. But it says in Job, it says, one day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord, and the accuser Satan came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God, stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, But Job has good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out, take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right. You may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. So what have we learned? We learned that God really likes Job to be like a, hey, this is the finest man that lived in all the earth. I'd like to be that guy. I'd like to be the finest man that God says, man, this is, this is my boy, Mike, the (laughs) finest man in all the earth. How about that? I think I'd like to be that guy, right? I mean, I, I think, I think we also realize that Job here is going to be tested right? That God is allowing Job to be tested, right? And I'm, we're going to keep reading. We're, like I said, we're going to read a lot of Bible today, today. It says, one day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with, with this news. Your oxen were plowing with donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabians raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead." I'm the only one escaped to tell you. Job stood up, tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. So literally in one fell swoop, Job has lost everything. He's lost his riches. He's lost his children. He's lost his servants. He's literally lost everything in one fell swoop, right? This is some pretty intense scripture. I was reading this and I'm like, man, one after another, like, one after the messenger came. Well, when the one was talking, the guy still came. But the one was talking, right? It was just really intense scripture. 
And I would hope, thought about this this week, I would hope that my response would be like Job. Like I would just fall on the ground to my knees and worship him. Maybe not the shaving of the head part. I don't know about that piece of it. My wife says, don't do it. But I would pray that my response would be worship, but that's a lot of pain in a very short amount of time. But Job has a choice. Is he going to curse God or is he going to worship God? And we've been given a choice. How many times in our life that we've been given the same choice where we choose to blame God instead of persevering in our relationship with him? Because here's the thing, God may be giving you exactly what you need, it just looks different than what you thought. God may be giving you exactly what you need, it just looks different than what you thought. It says in 2 Corinthians three different times, I begged the Lord to take it away. He said, my grace is all you need, my power works best in weakness, so I am glad to boast about my weakness. So that power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, if you don't know anything about me, that's okay. I'm going I'm to share some things. Um, I, I come from a just, I, I'm, I'm very vulnerable when it comes to just with my team, leading my teams, I try to be as honest as possible. And so what I was wanting to do with this morning, if it's okay, I still wanna to speak to you with that vulnerability. If I can be vulnerable with you guys here this morning. And I wanna tell you a story um, back in January of 2018. So little, almost six years ago, during 21 days of prayer, I started to experience the most excruciating back pain I have ever felt in my entire life. The most excruciating pain I've ever had. And like to the point where I am coming to work, you know, hop up on pills, coming to work and then living in a recliner when I get home. Right, I'm doing everything in a recliner. And I remember asking God so many times, God, please, God, please just take the pain away. God, God, please take the pain away. I remember I would go to the top of the old worship center. You guys remember the old worship center? I would go to the top and I would sit there by the sound booth and I would just pray, God, please. God, take away the pain. God, please, in Jesus' name. And I would plead and I would cry out to God, I don't understand. God, I'm, I'm, I'm a worship pastor, right? I'm a worship pastor. Like, I'm in the church right now. I don't understand why this is happening to me. And I went to countless doctors. I went to countless, like, specialist chiropractors. If they were in Branson or Springfield, I went to them, I promise you. Right? And I'm just going to give you the 401. My back is okay now. Praise God. Don't ask me to help you move. Okay? Right? Because here's the thing. People ask me, hey, Master Mike, can you help me move? And I'm like... Bad, bad back, you know. <laughs> like, I still have to be ginger, okay? I still have to be it. But I began to reflect upon that time of my life. And I spent the last, maybe like from, you know, 2019 all the way to 2021, just asking God, like, why this trial? What, like, I know that the Bible says that I'm going to go through things, I'm going to go through trials, but why this trial specifically? Like, I'm, I'm trying to lead worship. It hurts to sing, right? It hurts to play guitar, you know? I'm doing all of these things. I'm having to come in on Sunday morning, pop pills in between services just to get through. I don't understand. That may be where you are this morning. I don't understand, and I didn't get an answer until almost three years later, and it's never the answer that you thought it was going to be. The answer that you thought, God, why, God, why, God, why, and he, he just rocks your world. And he gave me a reality check that I needed, a very specific reality check for me and for my life. And that was my pastoring my worship leading, and the way that I was as a person had been carried out in my own strength, not his. Yeah. 
Not God's strength, but my strength. And if you don't know, I have been the worship pastor of this church for 10 years. And there have been times in my life where I do look back and I say, wow, I did rely on my gifts and I did rely on my talents. And wow, my faith was really, really young. And I wasn't spending time in God's word every single day. And I was trusting the gifts, not the gift giver. I was trusting the talents, not the one who gave them to me. And this period of my life was a harsh yet necessary reality check. Because in, if, if you've ever been in, in such agonizing pain, I felt like I had nothing else but God in this moment. And I just decided, you know what? I'm just going to fully surrender to you. I'm going to fully, finally give up everything that I've been holding on to and fully surrender to you. Am I perfect? No, I am not perfect. I ask God so many times to take away that pain, but I'm so thankful that he didn't because my relationship with Jesus is better than it ever has been. My pastoring is so much better. My worship leading, as y'all have noticed, is so much better. <laughs> Everything in my life is so much better because of the trials and the testing that I went through. I went from testing and trials to triumph. Amen. That's good. And it says in James, it says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so you may be mature and complete, not lacking Anything. I was not a mature disciple of Jesus. I was an adolescent or a child at best. There came a point, you know, Pastor Mike talks a lot about, you know, are you drinking milk or are you eating meat? I was drinking milk. I was been a Christian a long time, but yet I'm still drinking that milk. And what I realize is that persevering through those trials brings maturity to your relationship with God. Persevering through trials brings maturity to your relationship with God. Because guess what? Trials and things, they're going to come your way. Things are going to bop you over the head that you didn't expect. But we have a decision to make. Will we choose trust? Will we choose faith? Will we choose to persevere? Or will we make the wrong decisions out of emotions? And you say, you know, I, I, I can't beat that addiction now because it's right here in front of me. Or, you know what, I can't believe for that miracle anymore because I don't really know if God loves me. I don't really know if God cares about me. I don't really know because of all the things that you're seeing around you and you choose not to be refined and you choose not to grow. It's a lack of maturity in your relationship with the Lord. I've lived this. It's a lack of trust and it's a lack of faith. Because guess what? Faithfulness is yes or no. No gray areas, no clauses, no maybes. Faithfulness or not. I'm either faithful to my wife or I'm not faithful to my wife. It's faithfulness despite the trials in your life that create a deeper relationship with Jesus if you choose it. And here's the thing. Most believers never walk in the promises of God because they want to bypass the refinement of God. Most believers never walk in the promises of God because they want to bypass the refinement of God. And it says in 1 Peter, it says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You're gonna go through things. We recognize that. It's how you respond to those things that determines the maturity level of your relationship with Jesus. And then are you going to continue to be refined by those things? Listen, I get it. Refinement's not easy. <laughs> Refinement's not easy. But we have a choice to look towards God or we can allow him to look inward or we can run and do things our own way. 
I've done my own way. I'd rather have them look inward. And I, listen, if you're in this room right now, I'm not asking you to put on a fake smile. You know, I'm not asking you to act like everything's just fine, right? But you do have to be seeking him. You do have to be remaining in him. You do have to be persevering in him. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pick up the story. So he's just, he's been tested this first time. And man, he passed with flying colors, didn't he? He, was, he did great. So the devil's like, all right, fine. Let's test him again. And God's like, okay, sure. So this is where the story picks up. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. Man, that's twice. Finest man in all the earth. That's twice in one chapter. He is a blameless and a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. And he has maintained his integrity, even though you urge me to harm him without cause. Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin. A man will give up everything he has to save his life, but reach out and take away his health and he will surely curse you to your face. All right. You may do with him as you please, the Lord said to Satan, but spare his life. So Satan left the Lord's presence and he struck Job with terrible boils from head to foot. Job scraped his skin with a piece of broken pottery. As he sat among the ashes, his wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. But Job replied, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said, Nothing wrong. So recap, Job's lost everything, right? He's lost all of his riches, his family, all the things. And now he's in physical agony. He's in physical pain. Boils from head to toe. I don't know about you, but when I get a blister, <laughs> I'm in a lot of pain. I had a blister the size, I don't even know what size it was. It was so big the other day and it was disgusting and it hurt so bad. I can't imagine the agony that you're literally taking a piece of pottery and scraping off the boils trying to get some relief. But again, Job has a decision to make. Is he going to curse God or is he going to worship God? Is he going to let his circumstances affect his integrity, right? Is he going to persevere and do the right thing? Because his spouse and his friends all around him are, are being very, very negative. And this, this brought me to an interesting point when I was praying about this. Sometimes you've got to rebuke the negativity that comes around you. Sometimes there are people in your life that are going to tell you, you can't win. That you're not going to beat that. You know what? You should just curse God because you know what? It's his fault anyway. And there have been so many times in my life I have wanted to completely give up because of what people are telling around me. People are telling me all of these negative things. Well, it must be true. And I know there have been people in this room that have had things spoken over you. Ernie talked a lot about this last week. People in this room that have been, things have been spoken over you. You're an accident. You're a mistake. You're not wanted. I'm here to encourage somebody here this morning that your God loves you. He cares about you. He wants you. You're not an accident. You're not a mistake. And he has a plan for your life. And I want you to think about that for just a second. He has a plan the creator of the universe has a plan for your life. And when you persevere through it, that's the only way that you're going to see God's plan for your life. It's the only way you're going to see the purpose for your life. And if you're in this room this morning and your heart is hurting, I want to encourage you this morning. It says in Psalms, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. So remain in him because he'll never turn his back on you. When you give yourself to him, when you start leaning into his character and you start learning his character through these times of trial, you will grow. You will persevere. So here's the question. How do we persevere? Right? How do we persevere? Well, the first thing is we persevere no matter our circumstances. It says in Romans 8, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes for them. No matter what I face in my life, my faith says my God is willing and my God is able. Yes, that's 
right? Bad medical report, my God is willing and able to heal. Broken relationship, my God is willing and able to restore. I'm having trouble making ends meet. My God is willing and able to provide. And it says in Philippians, it says, not that I was ever in need for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's a full stomach or an empty with plenty or little for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you have done well to share with me in my present difficulties. Verse 13, I can do all things, right? 14, Paul says, I'm in present difficulties and I'm going through some stuff right now. But in 12, he says, I figured out the secret, right? I'm going to get through my trials and I'm going to understand that to be content no matter what life is throwing at me, right? Little or a lot, starving or full, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Which means I can handle any trial that comes my way because guess what? I'm gonna lean into God in all the times, the good and the bad, and my faith believes in spite of what it sees. So here's the question some of you are wrestling with, I know. What if God doesn't do what I'm believing him to do? Well, number two, we are faithful when we persevere when nothing changes. We are faithful and we persevere when nothing changes. It says in Romans, hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something we already have? So because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. Can we be so rock solid in our faith, right, that we're able to brush off the negativity and the doubtful and the manipulative thoughts the enemy tries to throw our way? that we're so attuned into God's promises that we can rest in his strength, we can rest in his peace, and we can rest in his perfect will because no matter what the world throws at us, we're locked in. We're relentlessly chasing his promises. That song this morning, Waymaker, right? Even when I don't see it, you're still working. Even when I don't feel it, you're still working. You never stop working. And I began to ponder this and I thought, how do I know God's not working? Just because of the tangible things that I don't see around me? How do I know that God isn't working behind the scenes? Even when I don't see it, my God is still working, amen? Let's go back to Job's story. So Job suffered for a long time. Some people say two years, some people say a lot longer, but Job is suffering. And I'm sure each day felt like a lifetime. It felt like an eternity. And I'm sure that there were times and he is like, you know, I'm not seeing you move as quickly as I thought you would. I'm not moving. Because here's the thing. My wife pointed this out to me last night. It's like, Job didn't have the book of Job. <laughs> Right? Like, he didn't know what was going to happen. Like, we're like, oh, dude, don't you know it's going to happen for you? Like, he didn't have the book of Job. Right? And he's not seeing God move as quickly as maybe he would. And I know there are people here in this room that have had prayers and that are praying. And you're praying and you're like, God, I'm not seeing it. God, where's the timing on this? You're like, God, your timing, ugh, my timing, okay. And it reminds me of chicken pot pie. <laughs> go, with, go with me on this. Go with me. How many people love chicken pot pie? I had to do a food illustration, if you know me at all. I love chicken pot pie. It's one of my absolute favorite things to eat and I don't eat it as often as I should or could because I would balloon up, I really would. And how many people know not all chicken pot pies are the same, all right? So we have the banquet, okay? Four and a half minutes on high in the microwave. I do know the time. This is, listen, this is a quick, Right, this is a quick little like lunch, you know, you can just, you know, just nice and easy for lunch, okay? How about this one? Marie Callender's. 
Okay, so ho oh, yo, yeah. right? So still pretty good. I mean, you know, you can throw this in the, in the oven if you want, but really, I mean, it says microwave, like must be cooked really. Like it's got some good ingredients in it, you know, right? It's pretty good, but it still comes from a box. How about this one right here? Homemade, real deal chicken pot pie that I spent all day. No, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> no. Just popped it in the oven. It's fine. But this one took time, right? This one was made from scratch. This one took hours. And it looks so delicious. I baked it this morning. And it brought me to this point that there's all these different types of chicken pot pies, but which one's going to taste the best? Right? It's going to be this one that you throw in the oven. And our God is not an oven God. He's a microwave God. I mean, he's not a microwave God. He's an oven God. Listen, got to give me a little bit of grace here today, okay? Our God is an oven God, not a microwave God. Our relationship with Jesus is an oven relationship, right? Takes a little patience, takes a little time, a little more dedication, right, in our relationship, persevering through some things, right? Not rushing things, not taking shortcuts, little slowly, carefully, lovingly, his time, right, shaping us into something that he's called and created us to be. Microwave solutions, quick, right? They're easy, but they don't have the depth and they don't have the richness of something that's been given time to develop. He knows exactly what you need here this morning. He understands that growth takes time. If I look back on the story of mine, growth took time. It took me an entire year of my life, but I'm so thankful because I'm a better husband, father, worship pastor, and pastor because God's timing is worth the wait. I wish he'd answer me faster sometimes. I wish he'd do the miracle right then. We've seen miracles have happened right here in this service. Healings happen. Sometimes I wish God would do that for me, but I know that God's doing things that are best for me. I just can't see them. Even when, I, even when I don't see it, I know he's still working. It says in Romans, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Number three, perseverance starts small and becomes monumental. Perseverance starts small and becomes monumental. Small things become monumental. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer Right, a little more perseverance to play out. And it reminds me of a story in Elijah, and I'm just gonna read it because I'm running low on time. I'm gonna go ahead and just read this. Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. You might be on the third rung. You might be on the third piece of the mountain, right? You might be on the, on the third trip to the edge of the mountain. Mountain, right? But God is going to show up and God is going to answer and move in monumental ways if you don't give up, right? If you're faithful and you persevere, even when you don't see any clouds in the sky, right? What if Elijah would have just stopped after four or five times and he would have said, you know, you see anything yet? Yeah. No. Nope. You see anything? No. Nope. Like what if he would have stopped? right? We quit way too early when God wants to keep pushing and he wants us to persevere. What if Elijah would have said, really God, that's the biggest cloud you're going to give me? The size of a fist? God, don't you realize like we've had a drought for three years and all you give me is this little bitty cloud and that's what we do in our lives. We slap God in the face because the miracles he's done in our lives are not big enough for us. 
And we don't understand that small miracles turn into big miracles, which then turn into grand finales of our life, and we're blessed to experience them. It says in Romans, it says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So let's move on to number four. Perseverance leads to restoration. Perseverance leads to restoration. So if we summarize the chapter, right, we summarize Job, right, he loses everything, he's in physical agony, his loved ones turn on him, but then God restores Job. And it says in Job 42, it says, when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as before than all his brothers and sisters, former friends, came and feasted with him in his home and they consoled him and comforted him because of all the trials the Lord had brought against him. The fact is that Job persevered through his trials. Was he perfect? I'm sure he wasn't perfect. I'm sure there were doubts and there were questions if you read the rest of the book, but he never gave up, right? He never gave up. And when you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ and when you're persevering through something and you're going through hard times and you're going through storms and you're going through battles, God doesn't expect perfection, but he does desire progression. James says, just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Anything that is alive is growing, right? We must be growing. It's not all about works. It's not about doing a job, right? But experiencing the richness of life that you never knew was possible. And it says in Philippians, it says, when I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God, that energy is God's energy and energy deep within you. It's about persevering one day at a time. One day at a time. Matthew says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Come on, how many people know each day has enough trouble on its own? I can't worry about tomorrow. I got to focus on my relationship with Jesus now, right here in this moment. I got to focus on it one day at a time because I'm going to embrace his words. I'm going to embrace his grace. I'm going to embrace his mercy and I'm going to trust my worries and my future to him. And I'm going to cultivate that relationship with Jesus and that deeper relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're in this room right now and you're like, you know, Mike, you've said some really interesting things today. You're like, I don't, I don't know this Jesus person that you're talking about. I don't, I don't know him. Or maybe you're in the second camp here and you've fallen away from the Lord. I fell away from the Lord, but I came back just like this in a church service. It was a, it was a pastor who gave me an opportunity to come back to the Lord. And that's what I want to do with both of you here today. So right now across this room, if you could close your eyes, bow your heads, put your hand over your heart. And if this is you, the Bible says you just gotta believe it. Say it with your mouth, confess and believe that he is Lord and you will be saved. If everybody in this room right now would just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. I believe your blood washes away all my sins. Come be a part of my life today. I commit my life to you. I am forgiven, I am chosen, and I matter. Holy Spirit, begin to work in hearts and lives and minds right now in this place. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If that was you this morning, I want you to do something really courageous. 
really brave, I want you to raise your hand. There's two reasons why I want you to do that. The first is I want you to be proud of this decision that you've made. I want you to be proud of the monumental decision that you've made. And the second is I wanna be able to see your hand and I wanna be able to pray for you this week. So all across this place, on the count of three, if that was you, I want you to lift your hand. So number one, don't be afraid. Two, we're gonna celebrate together. And three, get those hands up. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. See your hand. See your hand. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Can we celebrate this morning? Amen. Listen, if you accepted Jesus today, and even if you didn't raise your hand, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Thank you for watching. And if you gave your heart to Jesus, can I tell you right now, I am so excited for you. And this church wants to be in your corner. We actually want to resource you so you can grow in your faith. So if you text the number below, we actually want to send you a free digital copy of the book, Following Jesus. It's going to help answer some questions you may have and give you some next steps you need to take to grow in your relationship with Jesus. Again, thank you for watching. And if you enjoyed today's message, will you do me a favor? Will you like this video? Comment below, maybe share it with a friend. And don't forget, we go live every single Sunday. And until next time, pray God's peace.